Hello everyone, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. This is a long-running series of articles I've been conducting where I'm looking at all the various sectors produced by FactSet Research Systems, Inc., and I'm looking for value within those sectors. And a couple of things have happened. I've found very few companies that are in value, but the companies that are in value, even within the same sector, can be quite different from each other. And that's one of the things I'm really trying to focus on this mantra of mine that says it's a market of stocks and not a stock market. Too many people think in general terms about the market. Now ask me the question, obviously, what do I think the market's going to do? And I've always, you know, feel embarrassed or at least a little bad because I always have to tell them I don't really pay any attention to what the market might do. I pay strict attention to the stocks that I personally own, how I think they're going to perform as businesses, and then how the market's valuing those businesses. So I'm going to go through my 10 favorite stocks that I found in the electronic technology sector. As I'll illustrate here, a very diverse sector. Let's start with Apple. And what I want to do is make sure everyone's on the same page with me. This is the operating earnings growth rate of Apple going back from 1999. And the number's very high. It's got about a 26.5% growth rate. That number is actually kind Kind of distorted by some really aberrant numbers back here. So I'm going to shorten this time frame to a 12-year growth rate. And now you're still seeing a high growth rate. You still see some high numbers. But what I really want you to focus on is the normal valuation has dropped to about 16. And I think that's because the market is looking at more current numbers. So let's drop the graph again down to a 10-year graph. Now we've got something that's starting to be reasonable. And what I'm emphasizing here is that this is an analytical tool and it's dynamic. You can change these time frames as I'm doing that and evaluate what you're looking at. So what I'm starting to see here is going back to 2012, Apple's grown about 14% a year, a little bit of cyclicality. You could see some down years, followed by some up years, followed by some down years, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's been a pretty consistent performer all in all. What I want you to notice is the market has been, I think, appropriately valuing it at approximately a 15 PE ratio. And the 14 and a half to 15, just by looking at this like this, these aren't different numbers. These should always be thought of as ranges anyway, rather than precise calculations. Nevertheless, this provides you a really good perspective evaluation. Now, Apple is a stock that tends to run hot and cold. People really love it or really hate it. As I've gone through this presentation so far, when I look at these longer time frames, you should get the perspective that Apple was a growth stock. You know, here's a 41% growth rate going back to 2003. As I shorten the graph again, you see the growth rate altering. Here's 29.3%. But as I'm looking at these more current numbers that I just was looking at, you're looking at a 14 and a half to 15 PE ratio based on a growth rate of about 14% per year. But what I want you to get out of this is you can clearly see when the market was overvalued. And coming into the end of 2018, Apple was significantly overvalued. And then as we kind of went into the year, we got in, even into December of the year. Now notice Apple has a September fiscal year. Apple stock price fell precipitously, kind of from peak to trough here. That was a 30% drop. And of course, all types of discussions about what's wrong with Apple. And I think nothing was wrong with Apple. I think there was something wrong with how the market was valuing Apple. Now, as we look to the future with Apple, we see something that's, again, more or less the same of what we've seen before. We see some expectations of some cyclicality. Now, the long-term growth rate, the market expects Apple to grow at about 10% a year. But I like to go into the custom calculator, and I like to combine the long-term growth rate, which is the three to five-year number here, with the current estimates here, and you kind of get a perspective. So I think Apple's a good investment here. I don't think it's necessarily a great investment. It's certainly not growing like it historically has. It's an $806 million market cap. Its total enterprise or economic value is almost a trillion dollars, $844 billion. So it's obviously hard to grow. Now, a couple other points. Apple started paying their first dividend in 2012. And when I look at performance over this time frame, remember I've got a 14%-ish growth rate here. The company's paid more dividends than the market has generated. It's also outperformed the market, even notwithstanding the fact that the valuation is right now reasonable and it was overvalued a year ago. So Apple is clearly one of these electronic technology companies that is, you know, very popular. I think it's a valuation story. It was overvalued in August of last year. It's now reasonably valued, but you need to be making your future expectations based on what the expectations for Apple's growth are going forward. So I spent a little extra time on Apple because I wanted you to have a perspective of how the tool works and how I 
use it to analyze stocks and I just kind of went through Apple. So the next one is applied materials. Now in the written portion talked about how there are so many lessons in valuation here. Valuation is critical but it's it's not an isolated metric. You have to look at valuation in the perspective of what the company's results are, how the company grows, what its growth potential is. But I also want to point out that we had the irrational exuberant or tech bubble back in 2000 and you can see where valuations got crazy. Every investor should be aware of the fact that this can happen. And when it does happen, I think you have to be willing to accept that that's simply irrational thinking. That's not reality. But people believed it was. So many people went tech crazy during that time. But then as you look at the price and, and earnings relationship here over time with applied materials, you clearly see that the stock price kind of followed the operating results of the company. And you know, again, if I shorten the time frame, you can see that we get the recession the price dropped, perhaps in anticipation of it recovering, it kind of held its own. But you can see this very clear correlation between price and earnings. When I look at Applied Materials, which is an electronics production equipment company, is the sub-industry classification, it's cyclical, but it is expected to grow in the future at a very low rate, but it's expected to have a down year this year. So what that tells me is we've had this reaction to the fiscal year 2018, which was a really good year. Now we're going into fiscal year 2019, which ends in October. And what you're seeing here is that the market has reacted to this ex expectation of a very low, you know, a big down year for applied materials. So that's something to consider. The dividend record has been good. They've increased their payout ratio here recently. You can see that when you look you know through the operating earnings payout ratio but also with this particular tool I can actually go down here and I can point to the actual years and it tells me what the dividend payout ratio was for example in 2018 versus what it was in 2016. Now that number is obviously relative to the level of earnings. Here we had a very high payout ratio because we had two down years of earnings. Now we've got some growth in earnings but again, you can see what these payout ratios are by pointing to the dividend line here on the stock. Anyway, that's applied materials. Broadcom, or the symbol AVGO, or AVGO, is another very interesting company. And it's one of these stocks that you have to really think about what's happening. There was some unbelievable growth back in 2009 and 2010. So you have to really take those numbers out. But So this company is capable of growing at very high rates. But more recently, the growth rate has slowed down dramatically. It's been averaging about four. 14%, but that includes a 30% year here in 2018. Now, this is mostly forecast data here. I only got 2018 on the graph. But anyway, Broadcom, I think the key thing here is to look at the blue line. The normal valuation for a stock like Broadcom has been about 15 times earnings. Even if I look at their long history, you know, you can see here it was 13.8. Again, these are mathematical calculations, but they give you a perspective. So somewhere between 14 to 16 times earnings is going to be a reasonable valuation, I think, for Broadcom. So if I look at normal multiples here, I've got a 15 multiple. If I use this drop down, I see my range. I can use the low multiple of 13 and go ahead and apply it here. And, you know, that gives me an opportunity to make some still some pretty decent rates of return. If I use one of the higher multiples that the stock has traded at, let's say I'll use the 15.2 here and go ahead and apply it to the graph, then I start getting into some really very attractive numbers out for the next couple of years. And I do want you to notice the analyst scorecard on Broadcom has been very good. The analysts get this company right most of the time. They hit the estimates about 75 to 78 percent of the time. They beat it about 20 to 25 percent of the time. And there's been no misses on their scorecard. So the analysts are getting Broadcom right, we'll call it. Now, the next one is a company, I know it is Flextronics. It's now called uh, Flex Limited. And when I look at the historical graph of this company, you get, again, you get this lesson in valuations that I talked about earlier. You can see how irrational the market can be. There was no fundamental justification for this stock trading at a 61 PE back in 1999, 2000, where these PEs were just ridiculous. You can see the amount of nerve nervousness and volatility. Then we start having a recovery. Again, the market gets overly enthusiastic. And then we come into the recession and the price drops dramatically. Just put that into perspective. You know, this here was a 83% drop in the stock price from October of 07 to February of 09. That's peak the trough basically in that period. But then we've had, you know, it's kind of some recovery. Now this company pays no dividend. 
The only reason I'm showing this stock at all is because it's so significantly undervalued right now relative to its earnings growth. But the whole secret here is reversion to the mean. This stock getting back to a more normal P.E. ratio of, you know, something like you know 12 or 13 or 14 times earnings. And if it does that, then there would be an awful lot of money to be made in this stock, at least in the short run. You know, their fiscal year ends in March. So that's coming up real close or expect to have about a 5% growth rate. They're expected to do a little bit better next year. So if this trades at a more normal 14 or 15 multiple, it could be very attractive. If it trades at like an 11 or 12 multiple, then you know we'd still have a 35%. Let's say it still trades at that 8 or 9 mall. Here's 8.8. .8. You'd still have double digit returns going out for the next you know, a couple of years. So it's an interesting stock from a standpoint of recovering back to a more normal valuation. It's not such an interesting stock from a standpoint of growth or operating performance. Now here I'm using a PE of 11, 10.7. This would give you very nice rates of return going up. But to me, this is more of a speculation than it is a long-term investment. Anyway, that's Flextronics. My next research candidate really shows how different stocks can be. It's General Dynamics, the aerospace and defense company. I've written about this recently. Again, great lessons in valuation. You see a much more consistent performer here. And this is something I think investors ought to be aware of. This stock traded at a very low P.E. ratio. It was 9 and 10 times earnings. Just for perspective, I could put a 10 P.E. on this graph just to give you a perspective of how the market valued this stock and for how long it valued it. Otherwise, you see this correlation of around a 15 multiple was really what I would call a very sensible valuation. But here going from 2008 all the way through 2013, we had this 10 multiple kind of being a normal valuation. Now, we also had some flattening of earnings here, I do want you to notice. So the market was kind of, you know, saying the company's not growing. But then as defense spending became popular, the stock really rallied. And then coming into 2018, February of 2018, it became significantly overvalued. It has now since reverted to the mean. Looking forward on the stock, it's expected to grow at 9 or 10 percent. The long-term growth rate is 9 or 10 percent. So I think this stock is very interesting as a long-term hold again. It has a nice dividend yield. It has a great long-term dividend record. The dividends averaged about 11 percent growth. It's been an outperformer long-term in the market. And I think the key here is buy that an attractive valuation and then hold it for the long run and you'll do fine. You should get steady dividend increases and good long-term performance owning General Dynamics. My next candidate, very interesting to me, and I just want to talk a little bit about using the tool here. This is Huntington Inglis. It's an, another aerospace and defense company. If you go into the company's website, if you haven't heard of this company before, you can look at what they do as a business. And their primary business is shipbuilding for the federal government. They build ships of all categories for the federal government. So it's a very interesting company from that point of view. This is Huntington Ingalls. It's a very interesting company. Expected to have a down year and it uses a calendar fiscal year 2019. Earnings are expected to be down. And of course, that's put weakness in the stock. But then if you look out past 2019, it is expected to grow again. That's all going to depend on military spending, etc. The analyst expectations for the long run are ludicrous, in my opinion, so I'm not really going to apply those. I think if you're looking at this stock as a 15 multiple stock, it's got a moderately decent dividend yield, little debt. It's an interesting stock. Some people might want to take a closer look at or not. That would you know depend on your own feelings. Now, here's Hewlett Packard Enterprises. This is a spinoff, of course, from Hewlett Packard and Company. Let me go ahead and go to the historical graph. So it's been a, a short-term spinoff. It normally trades at around 10 times earnings. At least it has since it's been a spinoff. It's currently trading right at a blended 10.4. So you could argue that it's attractively valued here. It offers almost a 3% dividend yield. It's triple B rated with only 30% debt to capital. The company's forecast to continue growing at 5 or 6% a year. The long-term growth rate expectation is consistent with that 4 or 5%. So I just think this looks like a very attractive stock. It has an excellent analyst scorecard. But it's a short record, obviously, because the company's only been public since it spun off in 2015. But it's had decent performance during that period of time. It's actually dramatically outperformed the market on both dividend income as well as growth since it's been a spinoff. Now, it was very cheap 
when it was originally spun off from Hewlett Packard, but it's an interesting company, one you might want to take a closer look at. My next research candidate in this group of stocks is Juniper Networks. It's a communication company. I wanted to show this because First of all, when you look at the tech fever, you can, this is a classic example of just how crazy the tech stocks got. I can't, they don't even calculate a P.E. ratio because the earnings were so bad. If I shorten this graph, however, you see that the company has had you know, a lot of stock volatility. I'm not a big beta guy, but here you can see the price is all over the place. It's reasonably valued right now with a P.E. of about 14 and a half. Its forecast growth rate is about 5%, although it's expected to have negative growth for fiscal 2019, which they do have a calendar fiscal year. Long-term growth in this company is about 8% pays almost a 3% dividend yield. So this is one that, you know, you don't want to just get enamored by the statistics. The dividend yield looks good, but their dividend record, they frozen the dividend for the three years after they first initiated one in 2014. So the jury's still out, in my view, on what their dividend record is. But it's one you might want to look at deep if you're interested in a 2.8% yield. And, and a reasonable valuation. This is network appliances, as it used to be called. Once again, we see this classic tech stock. Do not underestimate the reality that the market can become totally irrational at any point in time. The key is recognize it when it exists. So many people were falling in love with tech stocks because we had this huge run-up. And then, you know, of course, they ended up with this reversion to the mean, and then the stock price has tracked the company's earnings going forward. The company just started paying a dividend in 2014. It yields about 2.5%. It was overvalued in August of last year. It reverted to the mean, including that December drop-off that I've been talking about in these articles. It's got a decent dividend record for the duration of the time that it's been paying a dividend. It's been growing it you know, kind of nicely. So here's a stock that looks attractive in the tech sector. It has 40% debt, triple B plus rated. You might want to take a closer look at this one for those of you who are interested in electronic technology. And here's an interesting company, a semiconductor company. It's more, this is more of a growth stock here. I need to shorten the time frame so you can see the growth. The company's been growing at about 20% a year. You can see the numbers down here, though. Or that's an average growth rate. They've also had some pretty flat growth, which I think partially explains why the price is low. They pay a very modest dividend, uh, you know, less than 1%. They have 35% debt to capital. The real key here on this particular stock is just simply a reversion to a normal 15 PE would make sense for this company. It's historically traded at that 15 PE, even when it was growing very high. So if we look at a normal multiple on this stock of let's say around 15, there could be some really nice capital appreciation going forward. Long-term growth expectations are almost 12% on the stock. It's got a good analyst scorecard. It had, they have had some misses, but generally the record here is pretty good, so you can put some credence into what the analysts are expecting on this stock. Anyway, this is a look at, and I hope you just got the perspective. I went through this very quickly, I understand, even though it's a long video. These companies are so different, even though they all operate in the same sector, but they also operate in different subsectors. So remember, it is a market of stocks, not a stock market. By the way, I've covered 19 companies in the written portion of this article. I'm going to be doing a second video where I cover the second nine. This has been Chuck Carmel saying thanks for watching.